Governor Huckabee, welcome back to North Dakota. Thank you. Good to be back. Glad the temperature is a little nicer than it <laughs> is in the winter. You, uh, you have some friends in North Dakota. You love this place, don't you? I do. You know, I love the culture of North Dakota because there are people that understand just basic decency, uh, salt of the earth. A lot of it is because of the rural nature of North Dakota. It's very similar to Arkansas. Strong agricultural uh, economy. That means people know how to work hard, respect others, respect private property. That's a big thing these days. A lot of people don't have any respect for private property, but they do in North Dakota. And those kind of things matter. What message did you want the delegates, the people who gathered today, what, what was your number one thing you really wanted them to leave with? What I hope they left with is the idea that we're not going to agree on everything. It, politics is intense. It's what makes it very, uh, I, I think, appealing to some people because it brings out our intensity. But we have elections. Um, we win some, we lose some. If we win, we should win graciously and bring everyone else with us. If we lose, we truly do need to accept that for whatever reason, people have chosen someone else. So let's help the someone else be the best they can be. And let's make sure that we don't have a fight among ourselves so that we don't understand the real fight is with the philosophical uh, opposites in this, what I would call not political, but spiritual battle of good versus evil. Because I don't know what else to call it when people think that it's okay to kill a baby right up until the moment of birth. Or to think that it's okay to mutilate an 11, 12 year old kid uh, because that child is psychologically confused and dysphoric. Um, to think that we ought to apologize for America, that somehow it's an evil country, that it's filled with nothing but racism and can't find the good in our leaders or can't find the good in our history. Sure, we've had problems. Yes, we haven't been perfect, but we've gotten better and we have built the greatest economy in the history of the world, the greatest level of freedom. We've empowered people who have come here from all over the world with absolutely nothing. And a few years later, they own companies and they're prosperous and they're raising families and sending their kids to college and creating generations of success. And if we can't see that and celebrate that, I don't want those people running our country. And that's what they think about America. I think this country's got some great stories to tell. Do you believe that our political opponents today are a version of American Marxism? There's no doubt about it. You know, the whole idea of critical race theory, anywhere, if you see the word critical, it basically means that you believe that there are two classes of people. This is Marxism at its heart, which says that there are oppressed people and there are empowered people. And if there are people empowered, they got there by oppressing the others and now you need to oppress them, and that's the way you raise up the oppressed. Well, that's never worked. There have been many countries across time that have tried to institute Marxism. It has failed every single time. And what ends up, you end up with a very small group of elitist in government. They rule over everybody, and those poor people are still just as poor as they ever were. It's just they don't have any choices, and they don't have any freedom. I like freedom. I grew up poor. But I didn't have to stay that way because I lived in a country that said, hey, buddy, if you want to get out there and work hard and, you know, maybe work, ha have to work harder than the people around you, um, you don't have to stop where you started. I like that about America and I don't want to see it changed. Um, there's been some rancor at this convention, like there are a lot of these around the country. Um, a couple of votes went completely opposite of what people thought would happen. Uh, you had a kind of a petty thing where the uh, delegate slots that are automatically normally given to our governor and to the two senators and our House member, they were voted off the delegate list to the national convention and bumped down to the alternate list. How do you think the, 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 the John Hovens, the Kevin Kramers, the Kelly Armstrongs, the Doug Burghams uh, need to do a better job? Give them some counsel on how they should try and, and, and win over hearts and minds on the other side. Well, I, I don't understand the, the mindset that would say, let's get rid of the people that have bubbled up through the electoral process, because like it or not, it's hard to get elected senator, governor, congressperson. That's not an easy thing to do. A little respect. You know, you don't have to agree with everything they do or say. But a little respect for what it took to get to that position probably is a good thing. And, um, you know, I'm not going to chastise people who, for whatever reason, thought that was a good idea to not seat them as delegates. But I, I would love to think that we would show respect to the people who have worked through the process, who have earned those positions. And, and frankly, we need some of those folks front and center because they know how to 
They know how to talk and communicate. Um, and they're good for us in those roles of leadership. I had the pleasure of hearing you at lunch today at the NDSU Alumni Center, and you talked a little bit about, uh, you know, when there's four or five folks in front of you, and they are immovable in yeah. their opinions and their convictions, but they're, you know, on the same team, we're all yeah. trying to get to the same goal. What the other way? What, what, how, how should the establishment better recognize that there are people there that have very different views, but that might actually win them over? Yeah. Uh, there's always room for every part of the family to really work hard to build relationships. And that, that's what it is. And it's relationships that have to be built over time. I think if, if you wait until you arrive here, probably too late. People have come maybe with their mind made up. Um, but I, I, I don't know how to fix every person who is contentious. You know, I can't do that. Some people are born to be combative and they enjoy it. I want to I want to combat, but I want to combat the Marxist. I want to combat um, the people who are leading demonic things in our country. I want to combat the people who are abusing the Constitution and shredding it uh, by using government power to silence political opponents. So I, I, I just don't feel like I got time or the energy to fight my own team. And I look at it this way. If, if I want to be the quarterback of the football team and I try out um, and I don't get to be the quarterback, do I quit the game? Or do I get on the sideline and cheer the team on and hope the quarterback who got picked will be the best quarterback we could ever have? I think that's my, my role to play. It's not to whine, gripe, crawl up under the bench and hope my team loses. It's quite the opposite. It's to do everything I can so that my team wins. And maybe doing that will help me earn the respect of even the ones who didn't pick me. You've been a political opponent to Donald Trump, yeah. seeking the same nomination that he wanted. Tell me a little bit, yeah, I, today in your speech, I heard probably the best argument for, the, for, for what Donald Trump did as president, yeah. as the 45th president of the United States that I've heard from anybody. Just mm. the, the, you know, the, yeah. the matter of fact, boom, 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 boom. Why do you lose? I, I think that there was such an overwhelming consensus among the Democrats to hurt him. But I also think that there were too many people that voted about his personality rather than his principles and accomplishments. I, I've never said, nor will I say, the election was rigged or stolen, because I don't know. But I do believe that it's hard for me to accept that there wasn't room for questions about how did a guy who barely popped out of his basement, 78 years old, barely put a sentence together, get 16 more million more votes than the most popular Democrat ever elected president, Barack Obama. How'd that happen? And how did we all go to bed on election night thinking Trump had won, particularly in the swing states, and get up the next morning and find out, oh, they found a bunch of ballots and he didn't. Maybe it's all on the up and up. So that's why I'm, I'm not saying it, it wasn't, but I'd sure like somebody to have done a real good audit on that process. And there were some things that just weren't right. Pennsylvania allowed votes to be counted that came in after the deadline that was established in Pennsylvania law. How did that happen? Mail-in ballots no check of the ID of the person. This happened in many states. So I hope Republicans will be smarter this time. It will be more focused on ballot security and voter integrity, because if we don't, um, you know, we could end up back in the same place. How do you think um, this round two for, for, the, for 24 versus 20, how do you think the president will be different? You know, what I hope is that people will do what uh, I remember back in the 80s, uh, there was an ad campaign called the Pepsi Challenge. I want you to tell me what you picked, okay? Pepsi. Pepsi. Let your taste decide. And Pepsi and Coke were put in boxes and people were asked, blind taste, to pick up, you know, one of the bottles. They didn't know which one they were drinking and say, which one do you like? And it was really a brilliant campaign because it wasn't picking the bottle or the shape or, you know, the brand that they thought they liked. It was actually tasting it and saying, yeah, this one's better. I hope that people will take a good look at their lives when Donald Trump was president and look at their lives when Joe Biden. How much did it cost to fill up your car when you went to the pump? Um, what did a home mortgage cost you? Uh, how much did bacon, bread, butter cost when you went to the grocery store? I mean, if people would just sim simply ask themselves, under which president did my family do better? And ask yourself, which president did a better job of creating 
a war, in, I mean a world in which there was no war, in which there was more peace, in which we're, our enemies were afraid of us. Instead of taking advantage of us and giving us uh, cheap shots and, and you know, uh, gut punches all the time. Which one? It gets real easy when you do that. So I wish people would quit saying, oh, I'm hardcore Republican, hardcore Democrat. Ask yourself, are you an American? Which one has made America, to use a phrase, great again? There's been a consent, con contentious battle within the Republican Party over funding for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, you gave a pretty good history lesson today as a, as a Reagan Republican. What would Reagan do with the situation we have right now with, between Ukraine and Russia? You know, that should never have happened. And I'm convinced, had Donald Trump been president, two things. Putin wouldn't have gone in because Putin couldn't have gone in. Russia was in such economic woe because of the energy situation. And I don't think people make the connection, but when Joe Biden declared war on American energy and freed up Russia to turn the spigots on, we empowered, we emboldened, and we economically rewarded them. Why did they go into Ukraine when they did? Why didn't they do it under Trump? Number one, they wouldn't because they were afraid of what he would do. Number two, they couldn't because they didn't have the money. So, you know, I, I don't want to see Ukraine fall, but if we're going to give them aid, here's what I do want. I want there to be accountability. I want us to see where it's going because Ukraine has a history of being about as corrupt as Russia. So it's not like you have really good guys and really bad guys, but what you do have is a nation that would gobble up the rest of Europe. And if they start moving into Poland, now we have a NATO agreement. And if they go there, then America is obligated into a shooting war that I pray to God we don't have to have. And, and Biden certainly made the mess that we're in right now, right? He's made the bed. But it seems to me the Republican Party sort of lost its voice in explaining why it's so important and, and making the case. They've not done a good job of that. And I think part of it is is because, uh, let's be real blunt, Americans don't trust the government. They don't trust that the government will send aid to Ukraine that will help them to win. Uh, they think they will send aid to Ukraine only to make sure that there's enough uh, bullets and bombs being manufactured that the companies making them will be empowered and enriched, uh, but not necessarily that will actually win that situation. If Joe Biden would reverse a lot of the energy policies and go back to trying to bankrupt uh, Russia, we had doggone near bankrupted Iran. I mean, think about how close we were to the point that the people of Iran were almost in a position where they could have overthrown that hideous government. But once Biden came in, started passing cash to them, eased up off the sanctions, those sanctions worked. And we don't have to bomb them, we can bankrupt them. And bankrupting a country that is our enemy and adversary is far more efficient and far less lethal and bloody than it is to bomb them. And very good for American energy. Yeah. as well. Last question for you. Um, will the uh, governor of Arkansas be the running mate for Donald Trump this time around? I, I, goodness, I don't know. But um, I think she's, she's only been in office a year. She's really focused on what she's doing. She's committed to it. I don't think that's what she wants. Uh, she loves the president. You know, people, when they talk about Donald Trump, I say, look, my daughter was probably closer to him than anyone in the White House because she was in, his, in the Oval Office more than any other person, including the chief of staff, every single day. Um, when people say horrible things about Donald Trump, I, I balance that against what my daughter says, who got to know him a whole lot better than most people who are his critics. He treated her respectfully, graciously, and professionally as a dad, that matters to me. If he hadn't have done that, I wouldn't be out there wanting to help him be reelected. No matter what my politics were, I'd take it personally if he did it to my daughter. So she's a, a Donald Trump fan and will help him get elected. She doesn't have to be on the ticket for that. Why do you think we don't see that Donald Trump on the stage that your daughter saw one on one in the Oval Office? Well, I think, you know, sometimes we have to remember he, he's a New Yorker. He's on a construction site. Uh, that's that's his mindset. And, you know, he's a fighter. But frankly, right now, we kind of need somebody who's willing to, to take the fight to the other side. And I'm not sure there's any of us who could put up with what he's had to put up with and still get up in the morning and answer the bell and go back. Good to see you, Mike. Thank you. Great to be with you.